Zion is calling us. Zion is calling us to a higher place of praise, to stand upon the mountain and to magnify his name, to tell all the people of every nation that he reigns. for this opportunity to enter into worship with you and to enter into a higher place of praise beyond our circumstances, beyond news reports, beyond our troubles in this current season, God. We enter into this moment of worship to glorify you and to magnify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the ferment of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the sultry and heart. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. That you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call. Sing it, is. Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. It's amazing. Say, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. friends say I am a friend of God say I am a friend of God I am a friend of God he calls me friend say who am I say who am I that you are mindful of me that you hear me when I call when I call say is it true that you are thinking of me how you love me your love is amazing it's amazing it's amazing it's amazing amazing it's amazing everybody here say i am a friend of god come on and lift your voice Lift your voice and say with me, I am a friend of God. Don't let nobody tell you different. I am a friend of God. You are a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Say, God Almighty, say, God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Oh, that's good news. He calls us friend no matter what. Come on, say, God. Knows what's best for us, uh, and like a true friend, he has our best interest at heart. Come on, call, he's called a friend. Break it up, God Almighty, say, Almighty Lord of glory, you have called me friend. One more time, say.
I'm so glad he calls us friend. That's why I have the uh, authority and I have a willingness to say, Lord, I lift your name high because you are high and lifted up. Amen. Come on, say it. Lord, I lift your name on high. Come on, help me say it, y'all. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I can't hear y'all sing it. I'm so, I'm so glad you're in. that you do everything well and everything is in your hand and that's why we have permission to say lord i lift your name lord i lift your name on high i love to sing your praises lord i love to sing your praises i'm glad i'm so glad you're in my life are you glad you came to save you i'm so glad you came Come on, tell him what he did. You came from heaven. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt you pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on higher and higher and higher. I lift you up. the name of the most high God good morning good morning good morning wherever you are good morning church by the side of the road we greet you with a hearty God bless you in a healthy holy amen we are church by the side of the road broadcasting here in Tukwila we want to welcome you to to our live stream uh, I'm pastor Terrence Proctor I have the opportunity humble to serve as senior pastor here at church by the side of the road so we want to and uh, welcome you and invite all members attendees and 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 even our newfound cyber and digital congregation to feel free to join in the song join in the praise join in the prayer uh, hit the emoji lift your hands clap your hands holler at me let us know that you're out there we invite you again to participate in this digital worship experience and also sub feel free to submit your prayer request uh, via the uh, comment section you can send them to our website and you can send them via voice message on the phone line we want to hear back from you but our heart's desire in the midst of the restrictions that are in front of us to still magnify the Lord to exalt his name together for this God he is God and he shall be our guide even until the end I will be reading from Luke 24 13 through 16 and 25 through 27 
NIV version. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Verse 25, he said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Here ends the reading of God's word. Lord God Almighty, you are clothed in majesty. Your heavens declare your wonder, for you are great and do marvelous things. Mighty you are, mighty you are, yes. Holy you 
you are clothed in majesty we can come before you lord god on this day and we are grateful god we are going to lift up the names that have been turned in as prayer requests for judy and jerry foster camille wilson cheryl Car carlisle mark tooley jb and his family and everyone with the with COVID virus and the god's protection over those who don't have it and the Tucker family, Je the Jennifer Ness family, Simon Johnston, Tammy Howard, Lottie Jackson and Jimmy Corbin, and Zutini, and Pastor Derek Forseth, and also the Parham family. God, we just thank you, Lord, that we could come before you. We thank you that you have put all things under the feet of Jesus, and you gave him to be head over our church. God, we just thank you, Lord God, that you fill us all with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, that we are dead to our trespasses because of your Son, who you made Christ, God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for all things, Lord God. God, we are concerned about many things during this time, Lord God, and you know what they are, Lord God. Every person that has a care or concern or frustration or fear or anxiety in their hearts, God. Father, you know it, you feel it, God. Father, I lift it up, oh God, to you, Lord God. I lift up this nation, Lord God. I lift up the leaders that are in charge and have authority over us, oh God. I thank you, Lord God, for every pastor, Lord God, that has a concern and a burden for all of their parishioners, Lord God, and those who love you, Lord God. I lift up every person, Lord God, who's on the front line, Lord God, that that's doing the work, Lord God, on the grounds, Lord God, in this season, God. Father, I lift up every shepherd, God, every shepherd and every person that's extending themselves, Lord God, to help all of us that are in crisis, God. Father, every concern that we have, Lord God, concerning our families, our finances, our health, our businesses, our churches, Oh, God, everything that happens that you have created on this earth, we lift it up to you, Lord God, because you are the creator, you are the healer, you are the deliverer, you are the keeper, Lord God, of our souls, God. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that in this moment, oh God, as we are entering into worship, Lord God, that you will give pastor, Lord God, the words to say, Lord God, the courage to say them, oh God, that we would hear them, Lord God, and we will move forward through this week, Lord God, with the words of encouragement that you have provided in this time. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks and glory. Amen. At this time, we are going to move forward with an act of worship in giving. Amen. We have three options for you to give. You can give online through our website, www.cbsr.org, or mobile through Cash App, that's CBSR2, or by mail to our P.O. Box 68545, Tuckwilla, Washington, 98168. We also want to encourage you during this time to continue to give toward the capital campaign and to... Uh, pour into that as well. We're just trusting God all the way around for our finances in this season, and that alone is an amazing thing to do during this time. Amen? So if you have your offering with you and you want to lift it in agreement by faith with us, and you're preparing to send it, text it, or do it on the website, just in this moment, we're going to pray and prepare that. Amen? God, we thank you that even in this season, we can glorify you through such an act of worship, through giving and through pouring out, God, of finances that we are only temporarily loaned during 
during this time, God. So we say thank you, God. Thank you for increase. Thank you for abundance, for more than financial abundance, God, but for an abundance in our faith, God, abundance in our obedience to still be good stewards of what you have placed in our hands and in our bank accounts. Amen. God, we give to advance your kingdom. We give to partner with what you are doing here on the earth, God. And we say that it is not a burden. It is not something that we regret or do grudgingly, God, but we do it with cheerful hearts, giving to partner with the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.
I really need you. I really need you. Please speak to me. Please speak to me. Please comfort me. Please comfort me. a word from the Lord and it's found in the gospel according to Luke chapter 24 I'll begin reading at verse 13 brother Bailey can you give me a little more on this monitor please and behold two of them went that same night to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs and they had talked together all of the things that had happened. And it came to pass, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16, but their eyes were holden that they could not, should not know him. Verse 17, and he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one with another as you walk? and are sad. Here ends reading of God's holy and righteous word. Sermonically, the title, top, topic, and springboard for the preaching platform would be Beyond the Veil. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this sacred hour. We're, we, we're grateful that even in the inconvenience of not being able to gather at your house, you've still made technological provisions that the people of God can still connect with each other and hear a word from you. Lord, we've always been connected to you. But Lord, I pray that we would hear a word, receive a word, feel your presence even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Beyond the veil. Here it is. The scripture says the very same day, two of them going to Emmaus. And as they were walking and talking, Jesus Christ attached himself to them. And he asked them, what are y'all talking about that has you so sad? And they didn't know it was him. You know, at my house, when it comes to popular music, there is a certain level of royalty. There's a king and a queen. We often fight at my house on who's more important. My daughter swears, Beyonce, the queen bee, is the hardest thing to ever hit the airways. But you and I both know that the king of pop, the one gloved one, high waters became fashionable with glitter socks. Michael J. Jackson. Thriller! And we fight and argue over who's the top dog. I am a Michael Jackson enthusiast, and one of the things that stands out to me in my understanding of Michael Jackson is that from his childhood up until 1987, Michael Joseph Jackson was an active practicing Jehovah Witness. Up until 1987, he would do scripture reading with his mother and, and do the Jehovah Witness service work of standing on corners and knocking on doors with watchtowers. Now, remember, I just said up until 1987, Thriller came out in 82, 83. Can you imagine at the height of Thriller, the most popular man in the world, arguably, Michael J. Jackson, 
had to put on full disguises to go knock on doors. They said he would put on a fat suit like the Nutty Professor, a mustache, hat, et cetera, et cetera. He was quoted as to say he would knock on the apartment doors in Thousand Oaks, California, and say, I'm here to talk to you about God's word. And like with most of you, when the Jehovah Witnesses come to your door, usually it's a Saturday and it's third and long and I'm watching the game. And they slam the door, Deacon Brother Greg, on Michael Jackson. Good goobly goo. Imagine that in the height of thriller success, the king of pop knocks on your door and you didn't even know it. It can be like that sometimes. Sometimes we can't notice greatness right in front of our eyes. On a higher and holier level, it is the same that some can see Jesus and not see Jesus. Let it not be said of us that he was with us and we, couldn't, we could not recognize the Christ. Could you recognize Christ if he, Scripture says he attached himself, if Jesus ran up on you, would we recognize him? Now, uh, elementary exegesis of this particular scripture would show us a couple things. When it says the same day, it's, it's very pointed and preferable that you look ahead. This is after Jesus' resurrection when, when, the, when the ladies went to the tomb and found it empty and saw the angelic host and thought the gardener had stole the body and it wasn't until Jesus said Mary's name that she knew it was him and she told him, told her, he told her to go tell my disciples. She ran. They didn't believe it. They came and and and, and the scripture says, and Peter kept it within himself. And by verse 13, to say the same day. Somebody say same day. Talk to me on the internet. Y'all you, you use them emojis to say hallelujah and wave your hand and everything. Same day. I'm not, now, put this in context. Emmaus Road is the same day that they found the tomb was empty. When it says the two of them, that's important because uh, one eyewitness validates the human witness. Biblically, we're two or three witness. It confirms it biblically. We got two witnesses walking the same day, telling the same story, yet perplexed. And Jesus comes alone. As they talk, as they walk together, they talk together about the things that happened. What were they talking about? Last week's message. They were walking, pondering the greatest story ever told. You see it there in the scripture. And while they were walking, the Bible says Jesus drew nigh. And, and, and this is a whole different sermon. As you walk, is Jesus with you only on Sunday or in your everyday walk? Come on, talk to me. They're sharing the greatest story ever told. The Greek word is egio, which means he attached himself to him. That is to say, in contemporary urban vernacular, Christ ran up on them. And they didn't know it. I got a question. If Jesus ran up on you at Safeway, at Costco, would you know it? If Jesus ran up on you at the mall, well, you can't go to none of them places at your yard. I don't know where you at now. Would we know it? Verse 16 says, but their eyes were holding that they could not, should not know him. Now watch this. We can talk about why would Jesus run up on them and then cover their eyes. It doesn't say actually why their eyes were old. But it does infer this, that they were disgruntled, discouraged, and depressed. And above all, it's three days that we had thought he was the one. Here it is. When you're walking on the way, even though you, when he says them, here it is. All right, let me go back to that. Two is a, is a biblical witness. Them is referring to the disciples who Mary went back to tell. These were two disciples who knew Jesus, knew the scriptures, and when he ran up on them, couldn't recognize them. You do, when I tell you, sometimes you don't have to be a sinner not to recognize Jesus. Now, why were they beholden? Did Jesus veil their eyes? 
What veiled their perceptive receptivity of Christ? Knowing folk like I know folk, most folk ain't changed. Humanity hasn't changed much since Eden. What are you saying? The scripture makes it clear that they were discouraged, disheartened, melancholy, and depressed. As they would say contemporarily, they were in their feelings. I stopped by to tell you, discouraged hearts can struggle to see what's right in front of them. Be careful that you don't let how you feel about what's in front of you keep you from seeing what's right in front of you. Luke 24, 13 through 35, it, it, it says Cleopas and his friend. Now, you and I both know that when the Bible says your name, that means it's important. But I also learned from my preaching professor is that the nameless figures in the Bible are also important. Cleophas was important because that validates that it was a disciple. But some argue who was this nameless friend. Some say it was another disciple. Some say it was Cleopas' wife. Maybe it was him and her. We don't know, but I believe he leaves it nameless so that you and I can put our names in there. How long have you been walking this walk, telling the story and still missing it? These two were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, discouraged disciples who actually had no reason to be discouraged. You can see in the scripture the story they were telling. They had heard the reports of the women that the tomb was empty. They had heard that Jesus was alive, but they did not believe them. They had had hoped that Jesus would redeem Israel, but their hopes had been shattered because what they were looking for wasn't what showed up. We get the impression that these two men were discouraged and disappointed. And God, because God didn't do what they wanted him to do. Let me say it again. It doesn't mean that God hadn't spoken. Doesn't mean God hadn't moved. But when what you think you want God to do, and how you get, and how we have a propensity and a proclivity to get in our feelings about how we assess what actually happened, it may cause us to miss what is really happening. Have you ever been there? And besides this, it's the third day. They misunderstood the ministry of Jesus Christ. Imagine Christ being with you and you miss it. They failed to grasp this teaching and the same inability remains for us today. We have pulpit preaching pimps who are penny pushers and peddlers that, that proclaim this prosperity of a gospel that has nothing to do with the biblical Jesus. You missed it. We have, we have so-called woke folk who have social commentary about the authenticity of the Bible. Don't let what evil men have done with the Holy Writ cause you to miss the holiness of the writ. <laughs> And until God removes the veil from their hearts, they will never be able to grasp true identity and mission of the Savior. Interesting thing about veil, let me parenthetically say this. When Jesus dies on Calvary, the scripture says that the earth began to quake. The moon, the sun refused to shine. The moon dripped in blood. At his resurrection, the dead who died in the Lord got up and walked the streets of the holy city. But what we see is the temple was shook at its foundation, so much so that the veil in the holiest of holies was torn. Watch this, the veil from the Bedouin people when they became a tabernacle folk and built a temple, the veil was the inner, inner sanctum, the holiest of holies. Only the highest priest could go in one year, one day a year on the day of atonement in the veil and he had to have a, he had to have bales on his robe and, and, and he had to have the right attire on so that if he went in and he wasn't right, you'd hear the veil stop because he dropped dead. But when Jesus died, the veil was torn. From top to bottom, watch this. So all those who could not see in could see. And the God that was trapped in there could get out. Jesus, beyond the veil, becomes the Christ who is receptive and available to anybody, anywhere, anytime, along any way. Somebody shout, amen. 
This is what Paul was writing in 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 16. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over there. Watch this. Hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit is of the Lord is, there is freedom. Meaning this, until we can only know what God reveals. And I pray and we must pray that he will continually enable the people of God to clearly see that this biblical Jesus is the Son of God. This biblical Jesus is the Christ of God. That he is both Lord and Savior who is worthy of praise and adoration. Now, I, I had to qualify that. Biblical Jesus. Could it be you can't see the scripture because the Jesus you're looking for is not biblical? Facebook Jesus not biblical. Prosperity Jesus is not biblical. European white Jesus is not biblical. The Jesus we make up in our mind is not the Jesus we... And the power of the Messiah is that he is who he is according to the scriptures. Verse 17 through 19, Jesus provides a provocative line of inquiry. 17, he said, what, what, what y'all talking about as you walk? And they said and began to spell out, haven't you heard the things that just happened? And he says, what things? Isn't it kind of funny when you think about it? By verse 19, Jesus asked, what things? Now, mind you, he had been at the heart of all the things that had happened in Jerusalem. And now he's asking them to tell him what occurred. I got a question. If Jesus asked you about Jesus, what would you tell him? Let me say it again. If Jesus asked you about Jesus, if God asked you about God, now next Thursday is the NFL draft. Most of us have a draft board. Uh, we can tell you who you want, who your team you, you want to draft. But if God asked you about God, what would your response be? Isn't that like that with Jesus? Our Lord is so patient with us that he even listens to what we tell him about what he already knows. I said he's so patient with us. He'll listen to what we tell him about what he already knows. You know, you can't tell God nothing about God that he don't already know. Let me say it again. He's so omniscient that he knows everything and he knows everything about everything he knows. Nothing you tell him is information. Matter of fact, I pray not because it's a news flash to God. I pray because I know he knows everything about everything he knows and I don't know nothing about what I know. So my prayer life, actually parenthetically, let me add you, is me being synchronized with what he knows. Can I get a witness? Prayer just positions my perception of this foolishness under a submitted covering that God is in control. Now the real problem was not the head. The real problem was not their eyes. The real problem was their heart. Luke 24, 25, 32, and 38. Look, he said, O oh, fools, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Hold on. Remember, they were disciples. They knew Jesus. They had walked with him. He had already told them that he was going to tear down the temple, raise it the third day. He already told them that he would die and be risen. He already told them that he would be suffering Messiah. And when it happens, they're discouraged. He said, why are you so slow to believe what was already prophesied? Then he tells, as they said to each other, did not our hearts burn while he spoke with us along the way? This was a heart burning issue. Verse 38, they go on to say, why are you troubled and do a doubts arise in your heart? Really speaks to the fact that we're not at a time where there's not enough information 
But we live in a time where we have information without inspiration. You can know the book, but except he removed the veil, you won't understand any of this. It is spiritually discerned. Come on, somebody. And what we know by heart may never reach our heart unless God removed the veil from our. That's why Paul said in Ephesians, my prayer is that God would open the eyes of your heart. Amen. So first he opens their eyes, the ocular sockets in their skull, in their cranium. He opens their eyes. He opens the scriptures and then opens their eyes. The scripture said he, he, he opened the scriptures to them. Now watch this. He doesn't introduce a new scripture. He said it starts from Moses and any good Jew knew the law of Moses. Come on, talk to me. God starts where you are and opens their eyes and they realize that Jesus was not only alive but he was right with them their basic problem the discouragement made it hard to see what was right in front of them and they did not believe all that the prophets has written I stopped by to tell you that I don't want to leave this in a high lofty biblical lesson but what about where you are what about in this stay home shut down in this pseudo isolation in this COVID climate what about how you see it has you in your feelings the basic problem of discouragement made it hard for them to see what was right in front of them is it are you at a place where it's hard for you to see that God is still in control because see when you trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him he'll direct your path you can trust in the Lord and have joy in the Lord you're trusting even in the midst of this this is still problematic today don't let how you feel about what you're going through make you miss what's right in front of you he said I'll never leave you nor forsake you do I have a witness don't let don't let it shape how you see the word of God as a matter of fact let the word of God shape how you see everything else this is the quintessential definition of being theocentric God-centered in my outlook Christocentric Christians Christ-centered in how I see process things somebody say amen and he began to break the scriptures down. That must have been a cold Bible study. I wish I could have been there with Jesus, exegesis, Jesus. Now we do know that Jesus is the quintessential exegesis of God. Remember he said, he said what he said? If you've seen the son, you've seen the... He's the homo osha, the same substance. He is in time when God is in eternity. Jesus, who exegetes God, begins to exegete Jesus. Imagine the greatest teacher explaining the greatest themes about the greatest book and bringing the greatest blessing to all lives. He, he, he opened their eyes to see him. Their hearts received the word and their lips opened the mouth to tell others what Jesus said to him. Jesus teaching Bible study. Good goobly goo. The key to understanding the Bible is to be able to see Jesus in every single page of it. He didn't teach him just merely divine doctrine or divine prophecy. Luke 24, 27, look at it. You still have your Bibles open, saints. And, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets. I said Moses and all the prophets. He expounded on them in all the scriptures. Somebody say all the scripture. The things concerning heaven. Nope. The things concerning prosperity. Nope. The things concerning salvation. Nope. The things concerning sexuality and moral compass, nope. It says, all the scriptures he expounded, things concerning himself. I said he's in every page. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the cloud of fire. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's the lawgiver and the judge. In Ruth, he's a kingsman redeemer. In 1st, 2nd Samuel, he's the prophet of the Lord. In Kings and Chronicles, he's the reigning king.
In Ezra, he's the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the builder of the broken down wall. In Esther, he's Uncle Mordecai. In Job, he's the day spring from on high. In the Psalms, he's the Lord who is our shepherd and we shall not want. In Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, he is the wisdom of God. In the Songs of Solomon, he's the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace, wonderful counselor, mighty God. In Jeremiah, Lamentations, he he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wheel and the wheel in the middle of the wheel. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the bridegroom married to a backsliding woman. In Joel, he is the one who baptized with fire and the spirit of the Holy Ghost. In Amos, he's the burden bearer. Obadiah, he's the mighty savior. In Jonah, he's forgiving. He's the forgiving God. I'm just trying to tell you who Jesus is. In Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he's the great evangelist crying for revival. In Zephaniah, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Haggai, he's the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, he's the merciful father. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness. Riling, rising with healing in his hand. God wants you to know who he is. In Matthew, he's the Messiah. Mark wants you to know he's a wonder worker. Luke wants you to know he's a son of man. John shows you he's the son of God. Acts says he's the ascended Lord. Romans wants you to know he's the justifier. First, second Corinthians says he's the one that gives gifts of the spirit. In Galatians, he's the one who sets us free. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of riches. In Philippians, he's the God who meets every need. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead. First, second Thelonians, he's the soon coming king. In Timothy, he's the mediator. The only mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's a faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's the friend that sticks closer than any brother. Do you know him? In Hebrews, he's, he is his blood that takes away our sins. In James, he's a great physician. First, second Peter, he's the chief shepherd. First, second John, the pistols and third pistol, he's the everlasting love. In Jude, he's the Lord who came down and is coming back with thousands of saints. In Re Revelation, he's the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the biblical Messiah. He is Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. This Jesus saves. This Jesus heals. This Jesus is the bread of heaven. This Jesus is living water. This Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And any other Jesus just won't fit it. Beyond the veil. He not only opened their eyes to the scriptures, he opened their hearts to receive the word of God. Verse 32 says it like this. And as they said one to another, after he unpacked the scriptures and how the scriptures pointed to him, they said, did not our hearts, what? Burn within us while he talked with us along the way and while he opened to us the scriptures open the scriptures here it is if you open up when he shows up he will light you up I'll say it again if you open up when he shows up he will light you up they would have they had been won by the word of God and they didn't even know who the stranger was all they knew is that their hearts were burning within them and they wanted that blessing to last. Keith Sweat said, make it last forever. What we discover is the more we receive a word of God, the more we will want the fellowship of the God of that word. I said, the more we receive of the word of God, the more we want the God of that word. Understanding biblical knowledge is good, but it'll lead you to big head. That's why we got information without inspiration. Conversation without communication. Togetherness without fellowship. There's an absence of divine revelation. We can be in proximity and still be distant. Has anybody been married over 20 years? Be in the same house and far apart. I ain't said nothing, Greg. I ain't talking about you. Don't, don't, don't get in trouble, Greg. But as we experience God, 
we will experience the burn. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, the B part says, by receiving the biblical truth and walking with the Savior, it will lead to a burning heart. Jesus opened the scripture to them. He opened their eyes so that they can recognize him. Now they knew for themselves that Jesus was alive. They had evidence that the tomb was empty. The angels, the witnesses, the scriptures, and now their own experiences with the Lord. The fact that Jesus was alive was not just in the head. And I stopped by to tell you, there's so many people that say, I believe in God, but do you know him? There's people that believe that the Bible is true, but do you know him? There's people that go to church and don't be surprised hell's going to be full of Bible-toting church-going sinners because you can be there and not know him. Do I have a witness? You got to know him for yourself. And now their own personal experience with the Lord, let them know he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. The songwriter said he walks with me and he talks with me. Now look, he's walking with them. Now I don't know, you may not be able to quote Genesis to Revelation. You may not be able to, to, to parlay and, 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 and exegete every particular pericope of scripture, but do you know him in the pardon of your sin? It's more important that you know him. He'll show you this. But if you know this and don't know him, we are almost miserable. Somebody say amen. Not only did he open their eyes, he opened their hearts. So now they can open their mouths. Scripture says in verse 33 through 36, and they returned declaring, the Lord is risen indeed. Now, Brother Greg, what's different in 36 that they didn't know in 13? They knew. They had the report of the women. They had the report of Peter and John. But see, people can tell you he lives, but it ain't until you know it for yourself that he lives. You ever been to testimony service and sister so-and-so called you and said how good God has been, but she didn't make it to testimony service, and then you try to tell her testimony? That dog don't have no bite. You let sister so-and-so show up Wednesday and testify for herself. Let brother such-and-such show up Sunday and testify for himself. See, I may not be able to explain it rightly divided in the scripture, but one thing I'm sure of, I've been born again. You can't take that from me. I know too much about him for anybody to make me die. You got to know him. And when you know him for yourself, you can open your mouth in witness. Let me show you what the anointing does. You remember in Pentecost, they were in the upper room. All of them knew him. All of them were there. But they were up there hiding. It wasn't until the Holy Ghost fell that they opened their mouths. I tell you, he'll give you an open mouth. The best evidence that we've understood in the Bible and met the living Christ is that we have something exciting to share about it. See, Big Mama said it like this. She, didn't, she hadn't been to seminary. She said, but once you come in contact with Jesus, you'll never be as, the same again. And could it be we don't tell nobody because you might not know him yourself? These two men immediately left Emmaus, returned to Jerusalem to tell the believers that they had met Jesus. But when they arrived, the apostles and the others told them that Jesus was alive and had appeared to Peter. What a difference it would make in our church services if everybody who gathered came to tell about how they met the living Jesus. If your services are dead, it might mean that you ain't really walking with Jesus or listening to the Savior. Come with me to Psalm 100. Let me put it to you like this. We, 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 we use that as a psalm of ascent often on Sunday morning. Alondra probably knows it by heart. She done said it so much. What he said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all your lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with what? 
singing. Know ye that the Lord is God and it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. Do you know it? We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Here is what I want you to get to. Enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving and into his courts with what? Be thankful unto him. Here it is. And bless his name. Watch this. Bless his name. Now, in this context, we who are blessed of the Lord actually have bragging rights. See, the scriptures will speak for themselves. But when you know him and you know that you know that you know, you got bragging rights. You don't have to have a DM, a, D, a doctor in ministry. You don't have to have a PhD in theological rationale or, or organizational leadership. But if he picked you up and turned you around and placed your feet on a solid ground, bless his name. Come on, somebody. One of my favorite football players is Deion Sanders. He came through in the late uh, 80s, 90s. Flashy, flamboyant, big old greasy Jerry Curl. Uh, he, before two chains, Dion had about seven chains. Now the problem is, a lot of people didn't like Dion because he was ex exponentially better than most players. He played two sports and excelled at both. But when he get it, he would get an interception, and he was so fast he would outrun everybody. But, but, but brother Warren, before he got to the goal line, he done passed everybody, and Dion. And they said he was too braggadocious. The problem was you couldn't catch him and he knew he got you and he was about to score and he would stunt on you. Come on, somebody. All I'm trying to say, even before he got to the finish line, he would stunt. Now, they changed the rules. You get a penalty for that, but not in the body of Christ. Even before you get to the finish line, if God has been good to you, you can lift your hands. You can do your dance. If God has already been good to you, you've got bragging rights to bless his name. Our praise is just bragging on God. When I was little, y'all ain't going to believe this on the internet, but Tony, we used to have to go outside and play. Matter of fact, one of my buddies posted, he told his son to go outside and play. And then he sent a picture of his son that took the PlayStation and the TV out on the porch and sat in the chair playing. That's crazy. It's a different time. We, one, we, had, we had to go outside and play till the street lights came on and don't come in and out. Now here it is. No matter where we played or who yard we played, whatever guardian that owned the yard, they was watching. And listen, and what nobody, I lived in a mixed neighborhood, what nobody calling police on kids out there making kid noise. You know what happened? When we got quiet, whoever guardian was would come to the window or the door. It's quiet out there. What is y'all up there doing? You didn't hear me. It's too quiet out there. And that became suspicious. Why? Because kids playing make a certain kind of noise. Kids quiet means something is wrong. And I stopped by to tell you, you ain't even got to be here at 3455 148th Avenue South. My question to you, if God has been good to you, there's a particular kind of noise that should be germinating from where you are. It said be thankful unto him. Sing praises unto him. Do your dance. Lift your hands. Shout. And I know we go to churches and we don't know if they shout like that, sing like that, dance like that. But right now you at your house. You only got half your clothes on in case your camera come on. But you can lift your hands where you are. You can bless his name where you are. You can do your dance. And my question is, why y'all so quiet? When God removes the veil, you know who did it for you. You know who healed you. You know who saved you. You know who brought you out. You know who went to court with you. You know who came to visit you when people stopped visiting you. You ought to bless his name. In the midst of pandemic mediations, I'll bless the Lord at some times.
and every now and then. No, that's not what it said. I'll bless the Lord at all times. When you know him, when he's run up on you, when everybody ran from you, when he saw the best in you, as Warren said, and everybody saw the worst in you. He opens your mouth and you have bagging rice. Now I know you might be too sophisticated. You got big house, big car, big money, big balling, and shot calling. And you had a better praise when you was broken, busted. Yeah, yeah. When you was toe up from the floor. Oh, yeah. But I, I'm going to challenge you. How you think you got that house? How you think you got that car? How do you think you got that stock portfolio? Yeah, yeah. You ought to be cutting in line to bless his name. Come on. Here's the takeaway. No matter where you are on the way. In the Bible, New Testament, the word hadas means the way. It could be a literal street or the way you're walking. Jesus will show up along the way. Whether you're discouraged or disheartened, he will show up. But as he shows up, if you open up, he will light you up. Academically speaking, enlightenment means to reveal beyond the veil. He'll show you that Christ is in it all. He is the light of the world. He enlightened them. And in the midst of this, sometimes God got to shut you up so he can open you up. Even in the church, sometimes God got to shut you down to open you up. What do you mean by that? Here we are. You can't go to church. I saw people chime in, and I'm glad you're on the page. But there's folk in there who wasn't coming if we was open. But now that folk tell you you can't go, that thing hit a little different. What I'm waiting for is when this is over, what a time, what a time. See, it's one thing where you don't feel like going to church. It's another thing when the man say you can't go to church. It's a whole different thing. But when we get together, when all God's children get together, what a time, what a time, what a time. I pray that those who he's opened their hearts, open their eyes, and open their mouths, that he open our hands that we can praise him, open our feet that we could dance, open the anointing that he would light us up. What is the takeaway? Now, when he lights you up, they said, did not our hearts burn while he talked with us as we walked? Scripture says, and they tried to constrain him to stay because he was going to move on. Let me say this. Jesus promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Let me tell you about the anointing. Though. The anointing. There's a corporate anointing that falls on all the people of God. Somebody say amen. And there God has a particular anointing for you. Now here it is. If you're not receptive to the anointing, the anointing will move on. That's why David said, restore unto me the joy of my, thy salvation. It wasn't that, Lord, give me back salvation. I'm saved, but because of my sin, my anointing has moved on. Lord, I pray that when he lights you up, if you open up and constrain him to stay with you, Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, Open their eyes, open their hearts, that they might open their mouths. And if you open up, he'll light you up. And when he lights you up, invite him to stay. They invited him to meals. That's why I think Cleo's companion was his wife. Because every man know you can't just bring somebody to the house and you ain't call your wife. I'm trying to help you, somebody. There wasn't no cell phones in emails. Come on, somebody. But that's just me. But here it is. And he opened their eyes beyond the veil to help them see the story they were telling him. And I'm done. We just have to have the courage to believe it. I know you're tired, you're wearied, and discouraged. I've seen your prayers, seen your prayer card intercede. 
and you're asking God for strength to get through this. Look what God is saying. You don't need strength. You just need courage. Courage to believe this Christ is in fact Christ according to the scriptures and that we know him experientially, not just academically, not just in your head, but in your heart and your soul. The word is epignosis. I know a lot about Michael Jackson, but I don't know him. Come on, somebody. But this Jesus, I know him, and he knows me. And I have the courage to believe this gospel. And courage has to be the common ingredient that all of us as believers possess to empower the ministries in which we serve. Courage to believe that the story we tell is still worth sharing. It is still the best hope for all of humanity. Courage to stand on our convictions that Jesus is the clearest visible expression of the invisible essence of a sovereign God. Courage to keep pressing that the image of American success is not the enormously expensive automobiles that we drive or park in circular driveways against the backdrop of meticulously manicured lawns. No, no, courage. That's not the image that promotes Jesus. No, a washcloth and a basin, a servant of washing feet. Courage to believe that promotes the kingdom of God. Courage to trust that a towel and a basin speak more about the kingdom than the balance sheet of your pocketbook. Courage to trust that take the gospel to the gaps in our culture and minister from the gaps. Preach the gospel. What requires today is folk who have the courage to declare that this God, he is God. Courage to tell people to map their lives around the gospel we preach and watch that gospel provide hope, revival, destiny, and reveal purpose. Courage to preach, not for fame or fortune or public approval, but preach to an audience of one. I preach because he called me. I preach to you because he sent me. But I don't preach to you for you because you didn't call me. And when you get tired of me, you'll dismiss me. But the one who called me is going to call me home and ask me, and I got to give an account for how we steward what he called us to. Courage to own the central place God has given the modern church in a critical time like this. It's not by accident. And church, God help us if we squander this opportunity to serve as a moral conscience for this nation at this critical time. We are called to have the courage to preach this truth to power. Yes, it's the foolishness. I can't defend why God has chosen to put this treasure in earthen vessels, but what we can do is let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in his sight. And that takes courage. The issue today is not whether we have strength enough to outlast COVID-19, but it's rather do we have the courage to believe that still preaching the biblical Jesus is still enough. We're called to proclaim that you can build a life on the word of God. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. I don't know about you, but I still believe you can grow a church by preaching from the Bible. That's the part of the courage that's necessary to live for God. To have the courage to trust his way to turn, turn some things around and turn it over to God and let him work it out. Our entire witness is built on that same story, coming from those sisters, returning from the tomb. Too many people saw him with nails in his hands, spike in his feet, bloody and matted crown on his head. As he carried that cross, hung between them, died. I still know, believe, and stand that the risen Lord is still the answer. And the rumor was, he's not dead, he's still alive. Do you still believe that? Do you still believe that? You might be listening because you wanted to find out what they're doing over there. And this is the first time God has opened your eyes, your heart. Scripture says, if you 
the gospel has been preached. If you believe it and receive it and willing to be courageous and confess it, thou shalt be saved. If you're listening and you're saved, but, but you've been discouraged, you've been beat down, worn down by all this that's going on. Listen, we have hope in this same story that he'll keep us, strengthen us, and all of this will work for our good, our growth, and his glory. I want you to be encouraged. But, but if you need prayer, type it in there. We'll keep praying for you. But if you're here and you want to give your life to Christ, you want to know, you know some of the scriptures, you know what the Bible says or infers, but you don't know him. Shoot us a message. Hit us up, www.cbsr.org. Our ministers, our deacons, our elders will reply with you and follow up with you. Just present Jesus as a way to stay sane in an insane culture. It's our only country, our country's only hope and real ambition. I pray that God has removed the veil from our eyes, our heart, and from our mouth that we might bear witness that this God, he is God. God bless you. God keep you. Christ, biblical Jesus, beyond the veil. announcements this morning. First of all, we'd like to thank God and welcome the newest addition to the CBSR family, baby Jim Bennett Proctor Mills Jr., or JJ for short. He arrived April 15th and weighed in at 6 pounds, 12 ounces. And we congratulate his proud parents, Minister J.B. Proctor Mills Sr., and his lovely wife, Jenea. Also, just a reminder that our Spring Gala fundraiser has been rescheduled for May 1st, 2021. So if you purchase tickets for this year, you can contact the church office for additional information. Thank you for joining us this morning. God bless you and have a great week.
belongs to you. Amen. God bless you. Feel free to join us on our website. We'll pray with you. We're praying for you. May the grace of our Lord and Savior and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest rule and abide with you henceforth now. May he attach himself as you walk along the way. May he continually open your eyes, your heart, that you might open your mouth and have the courage to proclaim this gospel. Go in peace. Go in grace. Blessed be the name of the Lord.